ever felt wounded. The reality is I think we in this room probably have an unusually high level of wounding. Why? Because when you're in Christian ministry, you only, you're only effective to the degree that you have processed suffering in a healthy way. And I'm not going to spoil his message. I'm just saying, get your heart ready for this message. Bishop Emeritus Robert Solomon served as the Bishop of the Methodist Church in Singapore from 2000 to 2012. He had served previously as a medical doctor, a church pastor, the principal of Trinity Theological College, and president of the National Council of Churches of Singapore. Dr. Solomon has degrees in medicine, theology, intercultural studies, and a PhD in pastoral theology from the University of Edinburgh. He has contributed many articles to books, theological dictionaries and journals, and he has written more than 30 books, including The Race, The Conscience, The Enduring Word, The Virtual Life, The Sermon of Jesus, Apprentice to Jesus, The Trinity and the Christian Life, and The Reformation. He now has an active itinerant ministry of preaching and teaching in Singapore and abroad. So please join me in giving a warm, liberal welcome to Bishop Robert Solomon. Good morning to you. I greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and I thank the organizers for inviting me to be here with you this morning. Good morning. I'll get started right away with a story. I was preaching uh, at a Sunday service one morning and uh, in the message I mentioned a secondary point uh, talking about the experience of the first martyr of the church, Stephen. We read about that in Acts chapter 6 and chapter 7. And I mentioned that Stephen, just before he died, he saw the Lord Jesus Christ standing at the right hand of the Father. And I said that's a bit odd because in the other passages in the New Testament, whenever Jesus is mentioned next to the Father, he's always seated. So why is he presented as standing at the right hand of the Father? Very odd indeed. So I suggested some reasons, possible reasons. I said maybe it's logical explanation. This was early days before Jesus took his seat at the right hand of the Father. So Stephen was privileged to see that moment just before he took his seat. But I said, you know, logic doesn't really satisfy in this particular situation. And I said, I'm more satisfied with not uh, an answer based on logic, but an answer based on love. And so here, Jesus is seated, but he stands up, and, and Stephen sees him standing up, standing up because he was concerned for his servant. And standing up in anticipation, knowing what's going to happen, in anticipation of actually welcoming his dear servant into his presence. So I mentioned that and the sermon went on and after the benediction I was standing at the door shaking the hands of all the people who were passing by and there came this elderly lady and she was literally weeping. Tears were rolling down her face. She clasped my hand and she talked to me about her son Stephen who had died tragically several years ago and she said you know when Stephen died I sustained I received this wound in my heart that has refused to heal all these years and she said I, I really don't know how to heal that wound and for many years I was asking the question what happened to my Stephen where is he now what happened when he died 
And then she said, even in the midst of her tears with a smile, she said, today the Lord healed my wound. And uh, she said, you know, I don't know, but today I receive comfort that I've never felt before. Because I know what happened to my Stephen. And I know he's in the presence of the Lord. He did not die alone. And that he died with the welcome of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So she was really grateful that the Lord had healed her at that service through those words. I was quite stunned. Because you know, this is what happens to preachers. We sow the seed. We don't know what effects they will have. Sometimes it's amazing how a single word or phrase can mean different things to different people. And it's amazing how the Spirit of God takes words and then He uses words like medicine to heal the wounds of people sitting in the congregation. And what is true about, you know, uh, sitting in the congregation listening to a sermon, I think it's also true uh, for the written word. Somebody who's reading a book, a written word, so to speak. And this is what I'd like to uh, share with you this morning. I don't know uh, where to point this. I always have a problem knowing where to point it. It's, it's a mystery to me. It's, uh, it's on actually. It reminds me of a uh, pilot who was flying uh, that story, but better, I better hold back that story. <laughs> it's a sort of standby story, please. <laughs> Let me get on. That's the first slide telling you that story. But I'd like to go through these slides very quickly. We know the power of the revealed word. And there are different views uh, in scripture about the word of God. Uh, it produces faith. It is like light that illuminates the way. It is like a hammer that breaks the hardened heart. It is sustaining food like milk and meat. It sanctifies us. And then it also gives hope, endurance, encouragement, comfort. And it is like a surgeon's scalpel. I'll explain this a little later. It feels like a sword or a scalpel. And it is like medicine. Medicine for the body and the soul. It also brings freedom and it delights the soul. Beautiful metaphors used about the, to describe the power of God's revealed word. Now, I know that uh, that is very special to scripture. This is very special. I just told you that story of how God used to heal a woman's broken heart. But I'd like to also think that, yes, Scripture was written by people, writers who were carried along by the Holy Spirit, who, who uh, God breathed as we read in the New Testament. Now, would that be the same for us? Can I claim to be God breathed and carried along by the Holy Spirit? I'm not sure whether anyone has told you that, but I, I dare not think that it's the same, because that Scripture and what we write is not scripture, it's good Christian literature, hopefully. It's good literature that educates, edifies, encourages, and transforms. So I'd like to think that while the product is not exactly the same, the Bible and whatever we write, there are some similarities that we must recognize. Because we write not with our own wisdom and strength and energy. We write with the inspiration of God with the assistance of the Holy Spirit. So I'd like to reflect on this a little bit more, of how God is involved in our writing, in the process of writing. Now I'd like to say, by the way, uh, I'm going to use the word mystery a bit. It's mystery. Uh, I find a lot of life a mystery. Um, I've, I learned a Japanese word, by the way, recently, and it's called sundoku. You know what Sundoku means? Not Sudoku, but, <laughs> which was referred to earlier, but Sundoku. You know what Sundoku? Any Japanese uh, delegate here? There are Sundoku? Yes? Please explain. What's Sundoku? Yeah. Sundoku. 
Yeah. Yes. Good, wonderful. That's right. So that's what I learned. Sundoku refers to all the shelves at your home containing books still to be read. <laughs> and I, I believe that some of us have more Sundoku than others. But you know what it means. People buy books uh, sometimes for, for, you know, for their own glory to, to sort of show off, show off how well read they are. But I think most of us, we buy books hoping to read, but we all know that, you know, we, we have not read all the books that we find on our shelves. And one author uh, recently used the word empty library. You see, the library are those books that you have already read. The empty library are those books that you have yet to read. And in some cases, I think empty library is more realistic to us than the library yet to be read. And he says, well, we should not feel guilty about it. you know why? Because to have books that you have not read yet gives us humility. That there is, I know so much, but there is more that I do not know. And it is that humility that actually assists reading and the gaining of knowledge and insights. So don't feel too guilty about your sundoku. But go back and have a re-look at your sudoku and see what you can do about it. But, you know, this brings me to the topic of mystery. Because there are many things we don't fully understand. We don't understand these things. So take, for instance, the mystery of hearing. And here I refer to the wonderful passage in Isaiah, in chapter 50, from verse 4 and 5, where we read that it is God who opens our ears and wakens our ears morning by morning uh, so that we can listen to him, to hear him as one being taught. The Hebrew word there is limut. And limut means one being taught. It actually in the New Testament means disciple. So God opens my ears every morning to listen to him as his disciple. And if I don't have that experience, I have no real message to give. If I am not a limot, listening to God every morning, when I stand at the pulpit, I have no message. I only have a pep talk. I have only some information to give, some information to share, but I do not have a living word from God. So, that's a mystery. The mystery of the opened ear. And we need to listen to that voice amid all the noises and voices around us. So I think some of the best writers are those whose ears are connected to the voice of God. And they have lots of wisdom. Because they bring something that is uncommon. And I think that is how the word is made fresh. The word is made fresh by fresh hearing every morning as God opens our ears to listen to Him. Now, the mystery of speaking or writing is connected with that. Because what we hear is actually echoed by us, whether we speak or whether we translate that into writing. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, we are told that we echo what we hear that others may be blessed. Really, speaking and writing is echoing what we hear as we read earlier in the morning when God opens our ears. We simply echo what we hear. And then if you go back to Isaiah chapter 50, you find that the open ear is connected with the open mouth. The ear that hears helps to open the mouth to speak the word that sustains the weary. The word that sustains the weary comes from the mouth that is connected with the ear that learns how to listen to God. This is a mystery to me. You know, I, I cannot totally explain it, but this is a mystery because it's supernatural. It's by the grace of God. It is by the initiative of God. And when such words, the words for the, that sustain the weary, 
uh, come from our ministry, they come to the weak and the wounded, the lost and the lonely, the burdened and the broken, as these words bring healing, strength and hope. And what a great ministry that is. Yes, I'm always slow. I speak faster than I, my fingers move, so please bear with me that, uh, with this slowness. But we all know, I think for those of us who write, that writing itself can be therapeutic. What we write is not only therapeutic to our readers, but what we write, the process of writing itself is therapeutic as most writers know. Because it, when we write, it helps to explore our, our mind, our heart, and our soul. Uh, Susan Guber wrote this book as a cancer patient, and I quote what she writes. She said, obviously writing cannot cure patients, but it facilitates the process of repairing the damages done. Words have the power to mend spirits abiding within damaged or incurable bodies. The power of words. So whether it's words that we hear or read or words that we write ourselves, it becomes therapeutic because something is released in our hearts. As we write, we feel blessed and we feel often healed. And that's the experience of those who keep journals, very personal journals who write or those who write other stuff. Psychologist James Pennebaker, an educationist, and uh, 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 sorry, J psychologist James Pennebaker, an educationist John Evans, in their book Expressive Writing, Words That Heal, say that uh, there are positive physiological, psychological, and behavioral changes connected with writing. Writing itself is actually very therapeutic. I suppose, you know, uh, most of us are neurotics. Isn't that true? <laughs> you don't believe? <laughs> I read a book a long ago and the title was Neurotics in the Church, <laughs> written by Robert St. Clair. And I, as a pastor, I found it so comforting because, <laughs> because that explained a lot of my problems. <laughs> I not only discovered that neurotics uh, uh, you know, seem to populate uh, the church, but also found that, uh, you know, new, uh, ministry attracts neurotics. <laughs> that a lot of pastors, including myself, was a neuro I was a neurotic in a sense. Maybe I still am. And the church is full of them. I also, in my first church as a pastor, had some psychotics, people who <laughs> suffered from psychotic illnesses. I had five in my church. And uh, I had to learn how to relate with them. I, I sometimes joke this, especially with my psychiatrist friends. Neurotics build castles in the air, psychotics live in them, <laughs> and psychiatrists collect the rent. <laughs> well, I, anyhow, I don't know if there are any psychiatrists around me. I apologize. Well, I, apologize. I, I wrote a book, actually one of my first books was a book called The Hurting Heart. And uh, it was written with two psychiatrist friends. And we are just going to release the second edition, a revised edition. So I like to crack jokes about psychiatrists because they are such close friends of mine. But let me move on. There is also a mystery of reading. Because the, the entire process is actually, you know, surrounded by and uh, uh, filled with mystery. The mystery of hearing, the mystery of speaking or writing and the mystery of reading. Um, English professor Timothy Aubrey uh, wrote this book, Reading as Therapy, What Contemporary Fiction Does for Middle-Class Americans. He, in his book, he says contemporary literary fiction actually uh, does a few things. First of all, it provides therapeutic vocabulary. So as you read uh, these novels, you gain uh, vocabulary that actually helps to bring some healing to you, therapeutic vocabulary. It also reinforces the private sphere because reading novels helps us to actually examine our own inner lives. 
and then it builds sympathy among strangers living in a disconnected social reality. Somehow there seems to be some fellowship of the wounded, as it were, reading a novel or reading a, a work of fiction. Now it's interesting that the word bibliotherapy, bibliotherapy was coined in 1916 by Samuel Crawford. And I don't know if there's any bibliotherapist here. Bibliotherapist? No? It's such a rare field, I think. Bibli well, actually, if you write, you're a bibliotherapist, <laughs> right? Uh, a bibliotherapist is a specialist who uses books and reading for therapy. So that's what a bibliotherapist is all about. And we shouldn't be surprised by this because we read in the scripture that the Holy Spirit illuminates the mind and the heart of the reader. But somehow, as, as, as scripture is read, the Spirit of God is ministering, enabling understanding, enabling faith, enabling response, enabling transformation and healing. And I always find this a mystery, that words written so long ago can have an immediacy when I read them this morning, for example. How is that possible? How is that possible that something so ancient, written obviously so long ago in different contexts, speaks to me so intimately, so directly, so relevantly today? I sometimes think about that. And my thoughts bring me to um, the writings of um, you know, uh, a philosopher uh, in uh, in America, an American philosopher, uh, who wrote a book called Orality. And basically, the the whole idea is this: uh, that oral communication is more ancient than written communication, because in the beginning, people just spoke, and there is something special about oral communication as compared to, say, uh, reading a book. In oral communication, it's a very intimate exercise. Because if A is talking to B, then the very breath of A comes out of him as a voice. And thankfully, we don't see this visibly, but the breath actually falls on the face of the <laughs> other person. <laughs> right? If we can see it, we'll keep our distance. <laughs> Or we, we put all this freshness in our mouths, right? Because it's such an intimate experience. And, and the breath that comes out of the speaker comes out from his very lungs. It, it has just touched his blood. It is warm. It is very personal. It comes out and, and then it gently light, uh, touches the one who is listening. Now, if you, you know, when you read a book, it doesn't feel quite like that. Um, yes, uh, somebody wrote this this book, and I'm reading it. Okay, uh, I'm trying to understand his mind or his motive or his reasoning and so on. But what is it about the Bible that's so special? Because something that was written so long ago feels so immediate, as if God is speaking to me orally. And I think we understand this when we understand that every time we read, the Holy Spirit takes the word in the Bible and then He breathes into us. He speaks into our lives. And that's the mystery, isn't it? That what is written is the word, the voice. And what I actually experience is the breath. And the voice and the breath, they combine together to make this a very intimate experience. It always remains a mystery to me as I try to understand this process. Why an ancient book has such immediacy in my life, in your life, in millions of people's lives. How does that happen? I think the only explanation is the oral, the, the God who actually communicates through the written word also communicates through his breath as we read his written word. That's a mystery. And I'd like to believe that actually when we write, though it's not quite the same, something like that happens. 
because the Spirit of God, if He's involved in my writing, will also somehow speak, use the words that I've used to bring healing to somebody who is thousands of miles away, reading this book, and uh, how do I know it's helping? Sometimes I receive letters saying, you know, I was reading this, and God touched my heart, or God healed my wounds, and so on and so forth. And so we know, uh, this is not just a secular exercise. We type, we write, we publish, and somebody buys it, and somebody reads it. There's more mystery involved in this whole process. And that brings me to the, the mystery of healing. But let me tell you, uh, I better tell this story before I forget. Um, my time is running very fast. <laughs> I have four grandchildren, two granddaughters who attend primary school, and two grandsons. They are twins, and they are three months old. So I've been very busy as a grandfather. <laughs> After this, I'll run to see them, to uh, you know, help take care of them, and I love it. You know, singing to them, feeding them and uh, burping them, and so on, all these grandfather duties. And one of the things I discovered is, you know, if they are a bit cranky or they're not happy, I try to tell them a story. I just look at their face and I tell them a story. I tell them about a boy who goes to the market to buy fruits or something like that. And you know, I know that he doesn't understand a single word that I'm saying. But it's amazing, he just fixes his eyes on me. As I tell the story, of course I have to be more animated than I am now. I have to use all my animation skills to, to tell this story. But he's transfixed. And the, and the interesting thing is, when I later on, another day, tell the same story, he doesn't know the difference. <laughs> And it's the same experience, just transfixed. <laughs> looking, looking at grandpa's face. And I, I was thinking, I learned so much just taking care of my twin grandsons for three months. Learned so much about God. And I, and I thought to myself, isn't that how it, God may feel sometimes? He tries to tell us something. And we have very little clue <laughs> what he's trying to tell us. We are like the we are like the disciples who you know who had to have private tutorials after the public lectures of Jesus, and even after the private tutorials, they still did not understand because sometimes the Lord Jesus would say, "You still don't understand." <laughs> oh yeah, that that may be our experience. But you know what's fascinating? I may not fully understand the story that God is telling me, but oh. The presence of the storyteller makes all the difference. And that's, that's the mystery, isn't it? Uh, when we read the word or we read uh, uh, the, the word explained and uh, applied, uh, we may not fully understand. But the presence of the storyteller makes all the difference. And that is why we writers, we actually are in, we work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit. If you're really depressed, remember that. You are working with the Holy Spirit. And as you write, you are a partner of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God takes His Word and applies it and brings healing and enlightenment and insight into people's life. I need to move on. As I said, you know, I'm always behind in my... Uh, you probably know I'm not so good in PowerPoint. I seldom use it as, as, except for teaching, and not for preaching, because I believe you, do, you lose your point and you lose your power. <laughs> okay, I, I want to go to the history of healing now. And this is at the heart of what we are talking about, the mystery of healing. You know, sometimes the healing comes very gently, very nice. Sometimes the healing feels like a sword is applied to our 
lives to our hearts. And Hebrews 4.13 is a, is a verse that demonstrates that. Because Paul, uh, not Paul, but the writer of Hebrews says that the word of God lays everything bare before God. And the phrase lays everything bare before God in the Greek is just one word. And that word is connected with the word trachea. I think you know what's trachea. Tracheostomy, the windpipe through which we breathe. So the trachea is a very vulnerable part of our body. And it's a technical term used in gladiator fights. When uh, the winner stands above the loser, he puts his foot on his chest and then he grabs his hair and then pulls his hair backwards so that his, his neck is exposed. He extends the neck. And then he lifts his sword. And that action is the same word used in Hebrews 4.13. The word of God is a sword lifted on our vulnerable necks. And then the victor will look at the Roman emperor or whoever is the VIP there. He will ask him, what do I, how do I proceed? If the emperor says this or shows this, then the victor will, will let the loser go. But if he does this, it means the sword comes down. Now, I'm glad that the word of God is not that kind of gladiator sword <laughs> that destroys or kills but actually a surgeon's scalpel because that's what the word of God does the scalpel is taken out not to, not to cause pain or not to destroy us or take away our life but actually to take away the boil take away the infection and to bring healing and it makes us vulnerable and that's the power of God's word God's word is the power to heal sometimes with a little bit of pain and a little bit of scare in our hearts. But God does work like that through His Word and through the words that we write from His Word. Now, these insights also apply to human writers. I, I like to think that the words we, we used to write are also like that in the way the Spirit of God brings those words to apply healing of those who are reading. One activity that is often overlooked is reading together in small groups. In the University of Liverpool, there was a year-long research that showed significant therapeutic effects on patients suffering from depression when they participated in reading groups under a Get Into Reading program. There was a Get Into reading program and they found that those who read in groups actually found help for their depression. So there were the therapeutic benefits of reading in relation to depression and well-being. Now I've been uh, involved with a men's group I started about 25 years ago and we meet every, uh, well, every fortnight on Saturday mornings. We used to meet at 6 o'clock in the morning uh, so that nobody has an excuse not to come. But as time went on, uh, we, uh, now we meet at 7.30. We are all aging saints. Uh, we have difficulty getting up. But the, the common practice that we have been doing all along these 25 years is to read together Christian books. I usually choose a classic, one of the wonderful classics that you know, we have in our, in our library, the Christian library. And we take turns to read in our, in our group. If there are 20 of us, we read a paragraph each, and then we discuss and we pray together. And, and uh, the men like that. They, they love this approach to reading aloud because there's something interesting about reading aloud and reading aloud in community. And this is something that is actually a lost art in the church as this particular book shows. Brian Wright, uh, in his book, Communal Reading in the Time of Jesus, shows that actually in the first century, it was a very common practice for people, for the early church, to gather together to read the scriptures communally. 
it was communal reading that actually encouraged the early Christians. We have forgotten that. We have forgotten how to actually read together, read aloud together, so that um, we can be helped, we can be healed. Because when we read together, we, we actually discuss together what we read about, we share together, we encourage together. So let me conclude here by saying that writing, especially for us believers, is both inspired and a privilege. And we need to be inspired by God as we write. I don't know how your experience is. Um, I usually write my books pretty fast. Because I'm afraid I'll lose the inspiration. Like, you know, it will go off if you, your coffee grows cold. If you don't drink, drink it when it's hot, isn't it? So what I do is I just write as, as it flows. Later on, I'll add all the footnotes, endnotes, and, and uh, illustrations or additional quotes and so on. But I feel that it's important to let the flow out. Uh, don't, don't uh, at least for me, don't obstruct it by having 10 books in front of you and trying to refer and so on. I find that slows me down. So it, it is, it is a, in some sense, an inspiration to write. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we need to have open ears that hear truly wise and life-giving words and thoughts. We need to pray for those who will read what we write. Sometimes we forget that. We only pray for our writing, but not for our readers. So we need to pray for our readers, wherever they are, that somehow the Spirit of God, as I'm trying to explain, this whole process is a mystery. And without the actions of the Holy Spirit, something goes wrong in the process. So we need to pray for our, for our readers. Um, and it's a wonderful mystery, as I already mentioned. And I end with this. We have some time for some interaction, I think, if you have some questions and answers. And I'd love to hear questions or comments because it tells me where you are and what are your concerns. But let me end with this. Richard Jeffries was a poet who was one evening, one night, looking out of the window, his window, and found that he could not see the moon and the stars. And then there was a sudden gust, a gentle gust of the wind that suddenly moved the branches and the leaves. And he was so inspired that he saw now the moon and the stars that he read these, uh, wrote these words, infinities hidden by a leaf, constellations hidden by a branch. That's the mystery, isn't it? And sometimes when the, there's a gust of wind and the leaves and the branches move, we see some proof. We see something wonderful. And that is the beauty of writing and reading. Because when we write or we read, something happens to us because it, it gives insight and it can bring healing. Infinity is hidden by a leaf. Constellations hidden by a branch. Thank you. Say something, comment, question, share. If you're shy, you can um, you can just write on a piece of paper or something. Anything. I have a question for you. Yes. Thank you. Can you talk to us about the relationship between your pastoral work in person with people and your writing work when you write and? How much is the writing coming out of your pastoral concerns and just, just describe for us your life a little bit like that. Sure, thank you. I think pastoral work actually helps to ground our writing uh, so that what we write actually addresses where people are. And uh, as we write, we remember incidents, we remember relationships, 
Uh, we remember moments in our lives, and all that becomes alive when we write. Otherwise, I'll be simply writing theoretical information. Uh, information is good, but you know, information, um, how, how shall I put it? Um, you go to you Google, you get information. You go to seminary, you get knowledge, hopefully. Right? But you, you pastor a church, you get wisdom. <laughs> So, uh, you know, that, that's, that's, that's how pastoral ministry, I think, helps us to write stuff that uh, really helps people where they are. What time of day do you write? What time of day do I write? I like to write in the morning. Afternoon is not a good time to write. Afternoon is a good time to sleep, actually. <laughs> in, in my stage of life, that's an that's a affordable luxury because I'm retired. And then I like to write in the late afternoon. And so those are the times, early morning and late afternoon. This is John here. Yes, John. In your message, you refer to so many books. Do you read all of them? Uh. <laughs> because in, obviously you need to refer to the sources of what your information is. But it is very difficult, isn't yes. it, to be able to... Uh, yes. to read. There are many books I've read cover to cover. Uh, those are really worth reading. There are others that I try to gain one particular insight or uh, one particular experience and then I don't need to read cover to cover. I'm sure you have read books like that. You, you start reading the book and then you realize, you know, do I really want to finish this book? Uh, and uh, then, uh, I, I, you know, if you read some of, you come to visit my library, personal library, you'll find some books where the underlinings, the front pages of the book. But the, the, the pages after that are very silent. I mean, they're, they're very clean. <laughs> Which means that I basically gave up reading this particular book. <laughs> okay, but there are other books that are just uh, read a particular chapter or particular section that I find useful. Otherwise, you don't have time. Uh, Umberto Eco had, uh, the writer, Italian writer, had 30,000 books in his library personal life at home. I think they must be pouring out of the walls, so to speak. And he made a calculation. He, he said, if I read a book a day, every day of my life from 18 to 80, I won't be able to read all the books that I have. So that's, uh, that's realism for you. Uh, so you have to selectively read good books, I think. Any other comments or questions. Yes. Yeah, thank you, sir. It inspires me a lot, especially based on the words of God, and then you can write something really bless people. Uh, my question is that, how do you think about the uh, works uh, of non-Christian, written by non-Christian, because like I'm from China, and in Chinese literature we have a long history and a tradition. Uh, but uh, I mean, the Asian Chinese, and they, of course, they don't know Jesus Christ. So uh, I mean, uh, how do you, uh, how do you think that Christians should also read the books by non-Christian? And how do we think about these works? Thank you. Thank very you. Much. We must definitely read books. Uh, written by non-Christians, otherwise we'll all be speaking in an echo chamber or just repeating what we are writing and reproducing. I think we need to read what others outside have written and sometimes they write good stuff, you know, often actually. Um, I, when I was trying to read up on psychology and counseling, I read Freud a lot and Jung, Carl Jung even more. I came to the church and I found that they pronounced Freud as fraud. <laughs> and uh, Jung as junk. <laughs> and I, I felt that, okay, there's a kind of antipathy against uh, such people. And I, I try not to say too much. But I found a lot of interesting insights from Freud. He was not always correct and often he was wrong. But there were insights that are still very helpful. And Jung especially. Jung uh, 
has very interesting insights about how we are made, how we function, how culture functions, and so on and so forth. So I think it's good for us to uh, read uh, stuff like that, pick up the good things, and use it. Uh, because, you know, even in the Bible, remember Paul was referring to the Cretans. Uh, even the Lord Jesus actually quoted uh, a, a, a Greek uh, writing, actually. So, I don't think it's, uh, it's a mistake uh, to not read by non-Christians, and especially for us Asians, if I may address Asians and non-Westerners, Africans, South Americans, and so on. A lot of the books that we read come from the West. And then there's an interaction with Plato and Aristotle and uh, Hegel and, and all these guys. But very few books connect with Confucius or uh, other writers in Asia or Africa, South America and so on, who are not Christians. And I think as Christians we need to relate with this very, very much. Take for instance in Asian culture. Shame. Shame is a subject that is that has hardly been explored in terms of salvation, our salvation experience. Oftentimes, it's guilt that has been the main uh, center of uh, reflection. And Asian culture is very shame-oriented culture. And I sometimes tell people, when Adam and Eve sinned, what's the first thing they felt? Guilt or shame? Shame. shame. They hid from each other. They hid from God. So shame is a is a very important human reaction or feeling or response to our own fallenness. And how how does shame get sorted out when we stand shamelessly before God, who can see into our hearts and accepts us? The prodigal son came shamelessly to his father, and the father received him, hugged him with all the smell and all the tattered and torn clothes, the father embraced him. And in that moment, he got back his dignity. And, and, and I think that's something very profound that we need to explore much more. How salvation is also about shame, the removal of shame, so that one day we shall all look like Jesus. You know what that means? The whole purpose of salvation is to make us Christ-like. And to become Christ-like is to finally remove our shame so that we don't have to wear masks. We can stand with our renewed faces because God has restored our faces. As C.S. Lewis said, till we have faces, we journey on. So I think these are some of the stuff that I can carry on talking, but you know, uh, please, please read. <laughs> How else can you minister to your folks in China unless you mention the books that they read, the, the, the ideas that they, they've heard about? Uh, so, do read. One more. Probably final question. No, that's the chairman saying one more question. <laughs> he, he doesn't have any. One more question, anyone? Very quickly, yes. Uh, just, just a couple of comments. Since you were talking about shame, I thought that in our world today where there is so much uh, toxicity, that one of the things that as Christian writers we should explore is this whole idea of safety. How can we talk about God as a safe place? How can we talk about being safe people for other people to open their lives to? So it's just something I want to throw out there. Uh, the other one is a response to what you said about Hebrews 4.13, about the sword. And um, I just felt like you were being very kind talking about the surgeon's couple. But I think that the, the sword thing is, is, um, is there for a reason. Because I think sometimes God literally has to kill us and kill some of our, you know, our false ideas of ourselves and kill some of our dreams that are actually more selfish and ambition than anything else. That's just my, my little observation. Sure. I, I mean, if you're connecting with self-denial. But I come from a medical background. I, 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 don't have, I don't have experiences wielding swords, so, so to me, uh, healing is connected with scalpels, not swords. So it's fine. We, uh, we have different experiences. Thank you very much. I'm done, I think.